I'm here. I, uh, I was up late and got up late. <laughs> barely, barely got a shower in. <laughs> we had to get here. <laughs> broke, broke two things this morning already. It's just one of those days. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 uh, I watched the last voice Friday night, which I, which I, I mean, I enjoy because it's like, it's, it was just came out in 1987. It was like my twenties, but then I thought I'm going to watch Fatal Attraction. Couldn't, couldn't do it. Like I watched parts of it and then I just went, Oh God, I hated this movie. And I remember why. Yeah. I just hated it too much. You're like, I can't even watch this to do a podcast episode on it. Well, I, I watched, I like, I fast forwarded it and then I watched the parts that I knew that I remembered were the horror of heteropatriarchy. <laughs> there was so much horror in that movie. Yeah. I mean, like I was thinking about different genres of horror movies and there's this whole kind of like thriller kind of murdery genre where it's just like women who are just crazy or like super jealous or like they try to seduce men. And then when men don't give them the attention they want, they just go bananas. And it's just, uh, I mean, it's pretty much all based on fatal attraction. Isn't that kind of like the OG? It is. It's the OG. So both of the movies that I, that I chose are OG and like fatal attraction was literally the first, the, the first sort of, of that genre. And we all know as women that in reality, it's the exact opposite, that women are killed by their sexual partners, their husbands, their boyfriends at, at a much higher percentage than women, you know, going crazy because some guy doesn't pay enough attention to them. So it was really um, the first to show that. And the parts of it that I rewatched, you know, I, I had forgotten literally that, that, uh, it wasn't like a one night stand. I mean, it wasn't like, you know, 30 years ago, we didn't have Tinder. So it wasn't like a Tinder hookup. It was like, his wife was out of town. He spent the weekend with this woman. It wasn't like a one night stand. And um, the then she, whether or not, and there was a lot of debate as to whether or not she actually got pregnant, but um, the reality of it is that In 1987, at the height of, or close to the height of the AIDS pandemic, a man having unprotected sex with a woman, regardless of the emotional attachment or lack of attachment, um, was, was scary. And, and then the other thing that I remember distinctly about that era, that, that age, is that when this movie came out, they, they tested several endings. Um, one of them was that she, Alex, the, the, the woman, um, played by, played by Glenn Close, commits suicide and nobody liked that. So then they tested another ending where, um, Michael Douglas, the Michael Douglas character kills her. That didn't go over very well. It had to be the wife. It had to be the wife killing her. And there were, people who stood up in the, in the theaters towards the end of the movie, just screaming, kill her, kill her. And that kind of reaction to that movie, that was, that was happening in theaters in, in the, in 1987. Okay. Okay. I, okay. Now you're getting me going. <laughs> I was, uh, <laughs> I rolled into this episode. I was like about a few minutes late. I was just breaking things, barely got, got a shower in. But now, you know what, Elena, you just made my, my brain waves go off. Uh, we're about five minutes into the recording. It's uh, 2.09 Central Time. I'm going to welcome anybody and everybody, the two people <laughs> who might be joining us for this live stream. Um, hi, I'm Melanie. Melanie, one of the co-hosts of Red Power Hour. It's me and Elena here, Red Power Hour co-hosts, uh, calling in from where we normally do. I'm in Minichota Mokoche, um, and Elena's in Ogapoge, and uh, otherwise known as Mordor. Santa Fe, New Mexico. And uh, yeah, thanks for joining us on a, at a weird time. Um, I think it's just because this was the only time that really worked for us. 
And we wanted to get this recording in before Halloween, which obviously drops tomorrow. Um, our Red Nation podcast comrades, Nick Estes and Jen Marley, recorded a dope, ep- a very long episode about Halloween, like the Halloween series. Um, but Elaine and I were kind of, we were like, hey, why don't we do like a Halloween themed episode? And so we hatched the idea of um, using horror films or like horror genre, could be TV shows too, uh, to analyze heteropatriarchy called The Horror of Heteropatriarchy. Everyone knows it's a horror show that we live in, the world structured by heteropatriarchy. And then Sina, our lovely producer, was like, hey, you should make it a live stream episode. And so that's why we're here (laughs) doing this. It's our first one. It's our first one. I was actually a little nervous. I'm going to be honest. I was a little nervous. I feel unprepared. Like, I feel like I really need to, like, over deliver (laughs) today because it's live. But just wanted to welcome everybody. Um, You want to add anything, Elena, before we just, like, go in? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, I I was really surprised that we're not allowed to show boobs. Like, that was... I wanted to show a clip and Cena says, you can't show boobs. I was like, wow. Damn. Like a clip from Fatal Attraction that has boobs yes. in it? Yes. Wow. Like, what are we, 1987? Anyway, that's... <laughs> <laughs> so So I, I when, when Melanie talked about doing the horror heteropatriarchy, I was like, damn, I got to think, like, think, think, think what films. And I was just sort of off the high of the end of res dogs, the, the series, uh, this, uh, season finale of res dogs and Tim Capello that we'll talk about later showed up, which as an eighties kid, I think Sterling Harjo and I might be around the same age, like immediately had me thinking of lost boys. And then since I was going, OG, lost boys and fatal attraction came out the same year. So it'd be interesting to sort of compare, those two. And so I watched Lost Boys, which is fine. Um, I always enjoyed that movie. And then I tried to watch Fatal Attraction. And the things I hated about it in 1987 were worse, much worse this time around. And I think Melanie's going to dive into that. So, okay. Right. So <sighs> happy Halloween. <laughs> First of all, May we, may, may the zombie of heteropatriarchy die someday. <laughs> Hopefully by the time we hit Halloween 2023. But um, that's why I was talking about, I wanted to talk about it. But 1987, Fatal Attraction. All of these people in the crowd are up, like just cheering on for Glenn Close's character to get murdered by the woman. Okay, two things. What came out around the same time that just came out again and was just like a smashing success in 2022 and apparently not cringy to most people was Top Gun. Top, right? Top Gun came out in 1986, I think, the original. And I had heard from so many people um, that Maverick, right, the twenty, the, the, the sequel or whatever that came out this year, just like earlier in the summer, right? Um, people were like, it's really good. Like, if you put all of, like, the dumb shit aside, it's really good. And so I committed myself. I'm like, I, I I watched the first Top Gun, I think, when I was, like, eight years old. Like, I don't remember this movie. So I watched the first Top Gun. And like you, right, you were watching Fatal Attraction for the first time in a very long time, right? And so I was watching Top Gun for the first time, the original one, in a very long time to prepare for Maverick. And I was like, I hate this movie so fucking bad. Like, it's so, it's just a bunch of dudes circle jerking. It's like white male, heteropa- white settler, heteropatriarchy, just on steroids, like just really, I just so in your face with it. And I just remember how beloved Top Gun was to the American public, right? I don't know. I was, I was a child when this movie came out. I was seven, I was, I was five years old when this movie came out. So it's not like I went to the theaters to go see Top Gun. It was, that was inappropriate for me to do. But I would imagine that back then people got up and cheered and clapped for that movie because of like the heroic narrative of like behind the Tom Cruise character, just, just like men, just like flying planes and like the U S military, just like fucking killing commies and just like white men, just just circle jerking it together throughout the whole movie. And so that comes out around the same time as Fatal Attraction. And anyway, what I'm trying to say is the response to Maverick in 2022 was like the exact, not only was the movie the exact same movie as the original Top Gun, it it was like, we're like a post Me Too kind of moment. 
or like you know like these kinds of stories about like the, the the heroic white man like military figure it feels like you shouldn't really be making those kinds of movies anymore and yet maverick was just so massively successful in 2022 and so it's like it's just it's just like a really um entrenched uh kind of like a what's the word i'm looking for it's like a type of sexism i think in popular culture that just has such staying power it's like a zombie and that's why i want it's like a zombie and like no matter how much like you can me too that shit you can like stabby stab it in like the movie prey for example because i was talking about how predators toxic masculinity and it just comes back with like a vengeance and you're like fucking die zombie and then it just won't <laughs> it's true i i was so top gun and um lost boys to me, and this is, I was, I was an undergrad at UNM and I was in the American studies department and I took, um, several classes that I, that, you know, I had a lot of fun with. One of them was, um, popular films and the mm -hmm. other one was sex and gender. And I used to cross between the two and we had a lot of jocks in the sex and gender class. I think originally they thought it was like a how to. Um, and so they signed up for sex and gender <laughs> and, and, uh, I remember talking about Top Gun and it's particularly the volleyball scene and saying, and these guys are like, yeah, man, that is so cool. And, you know, blah, blah, these guys are so, you know, awesome. And I was like, you know, that is totally homoerotic, right? <laughs> oh, so homoerotic. <laughs> <laughs> like greased up guys with no shirts you know, whacking balls. I'm sorry, but really? <laughs> and they're all men and they're all playing for all men. And it's like literally the same thing as um, Lost Boys where you have, and there's a lot more about family and about, um, you know, the heteronormative nuclear family in Lost Boys. But ultimately, ultimately Lost Boys is about, um, pretty young boys and i'm not talking like like children i'm talking about teenagers you know Kiefer sutherland um was one of them dressed up in their leather with their earrings on very attractive young men penetrating one another and hanging out i mean that's literally what it was about a totally homoerotic there's only two women in that whole film there's the the woman star who hangs out with the vampires um but they don't have sex like she's like sort of a mother figure and then there's the mother of the two boys who are um being courted um by the vampires to become vampires so it's it's that's that whole movie is about homoeroticism and and about um you know men and again we're in the middle of the AIDS epidemic or the height of the AIDS epidemic, um, we're, we're dealing with, um, a lot of, um, fear. There's the gay panic, um, that starts around this time. This, this idea of, um, was originally used as a defense, um, for someone who killed a gay man because he would, he thought he was, um, coming on to him. And, that happened in, in the mid eighties. And, um, it was used as a defense. Like you could actually claim that you were so freaked out by someone coming on to you, someone of the same sex that coming on to you, that you, you had a right to kill them. I mean, it was the weirdest, the weirdest thing. And so this country, Merca is dealing with like AIDS. They're dealing with, with, um, you know, this gay panic they're dealing with, with all of this and these these two movies come out and they're really about reinforcing this idea of the nuclear family the heterosexual nuclear family and heteronormative behaviors and both of them though i mean it's funny how they're reinforcing it through one being a thriller and the other one being literally a horror movie about vampires the vampires have always been to me gay icon and and you just look at it even, you know, so vampires penetrate. They're almost always male. Like Dracula, the original vampire was was male. They penetrate. They share fluids. Um, and, you know, from the very beginning, vampires have been homoerotic and 
um, sort of a gay icon. And even yeah, they're like we, hypersexual, the way they're always very represented. hypersexual. Yep. Yeah. They're always portrayed then, as like having orgies and, you know, being pansexual, basically. Yep. So, you know, get, you got a lot of, of fear of, of, you know, the gay community in the 80s. And so you have these vampire movies coming out. And so I loved the movie because, you know, I was young and I thought riding motorcycles and wearing leather jackets and hanging out on the beach was cool. And then the tagline, and I actually had this poster. It said, um, sleep all day, party all night, never grow old, never die. It's fun to be a vampire, right? <laughs> it's fun to be. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> yep. That's metal. Yeah. And then you have Tim Capello, who, um, Tim Capello, who is the sexy sax guy, or that's what he's known as, who there's a brief clip of him um, on the boardwalk. And the movie's filmed in Santa Cruz, California. Um, there's a brief clip of him oiled up, wearing like a cod piece, um, and his hair's in a ponytail. And it just, you know, it was literally sort of the epitome of what the Castro district in San Francisco was like in the 80s with the leather bars and um, and Tim Capello um, was was like another one of these great gay icons that appeared in that movie. Um, and then on the cave of um, the cave where the vampires live, which is supposed to be below Santa Cruz. It was a massive resort. And then there was a, an earthquake and the resort sunk into the sea. And so that's where the vampires live. There's this huge poster of Jim Morrison, another gay icon. Hmm. So some tight, le tight leather pants, the tight leather pants, like the cod piece kind of, <laughs> yep. kind of look. So, so whoever, whoever, thought up that movie whoever wrote that movie was really coding it seriously interesting um, so okay real quick so that last the the this final episode of season two of res dogs didn't tommy write that episode tommy pico yep, yep. and when we interviewed tommy wasn't he like i'm just trying to like make everything as gay as possible <laughs> <laughs> did he say that yep And, and I Sterling... didn't actually know who that was playing yep. the saxophone at yep. the very end of that episode on the pier in Santa Monica is like the four res dogs. I mean, spoiler alert, yep. sorry. They're like, they finally make it to LA and they're like on the ocean and then it pans out to this person who you, you, you know, the entire like s cinematic history of this person who's playing. But I was just like, what's happening right now? I know that there's some sort of reference, but like, I don't yep. know. And so it's just fucking hilarious and super cool that Tommy wrote the ending to season two to be yep. super gay. Like, cause that is Tommy's mission in super <laughs> the writing gay. from Tommy's mouth. Yep. That is actually what he wanted to do. And <laughs> like Sterling Harjo said something. I think it was an Instagram post. He said, as an 80s kid, having Tim Capello on, and I was like, because I said the same thing. I'm watching that, the, the finale. I was like, holy crap, that's Tim Capello. And of course, everyone in my living room was like, who? I said, never mind. Like, you uh, you have to watch Lost Boys to get that reference. But but it, it, it was like that movie became really cult-like um, in oh, the 80s. I don't remember. I don't. Maybe I was just too young. I mean, I was a kid of the 80s, but I don't remember this movie at all. I'm going to have to go watch it. <laughs> yeah, it's quite something. Um, the, it, so it's very noir. Okay. And, and you have, um, so Santa Carla subs in for Santa Cruz. But if you've ever been to Santa Cruz, you know, it's at the boardwalk of Santa Cruz. And these young, there's four of these young male vampires and they're all in, you know, in uh, leather and they all have earrings. And Kiefer Sutherland is like the, 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 um, the head vampire. And then the, the young, the young guys, the two brothers who move in with their mother and it's very misogynistic, like the, uh, which of course, heteropatriarchy. Hello. Um, the mother, whose name is Lucy, um, 
she has to, she's forced to li- leave Phoenix where they're coming from to go live with her father. And, and when they pull up in front of his house, um, there's this, you know, scene where he comes and hugs her and is helping her unload. And he says to her, you're the only woman I know who has not bettered her situation by getting divorced. So like, here she is, this divorced woman with these two, you know, teenage, almost teenage sons, and she has to move in with her father. And um, so there's scorn there. And um, she's just a very innocuous, um, kind of bland character. Um, And she's just used by her sons and then by Max, who's the head vampire that you don't know about, who's courting her. And um, just very, um, so she's one of the only female figures. And the other one is this young sort of half vampire that, um, that the, one of the sons, um, Michael falls in love with and Michael just by some strange coincidence looks an awful lot like Jim Morrison. Oh, it, this is so fascinating. I'm really glad <laughs> you chose to take us down memory lane with this. I wanted to point, I mean, this is supposed to be like the horror of heteropatriarchy and the Twilight series is not really horror. I mean, it is about vampires. It's mostly just like teen melodrama, but Bella, the main protagonist, right? Um, The female protagonist in the Twilight series, she also gets, she lives in Arizona. I think she lives in Tucson or Phoenix. And she also has to move to a place where there's vampires living in the trees or like the forest (laughs) to move in with her father. Yep. And I wonder now I'm thinking like, okay, I, this is just, this is my, my hubris as somebody who's like, uh, like a, maybe half a generation younger than you. Like Lost Boy sounds like it's kind of like an OG. Like it was like something that created like a lot of other things in the vampire genre or maybe like in like queer cinema or those types of things. And so now I'm going to have to watch it so that I can understand the reference but you're right. I absolutely think you're right. And I thought, I thought that I didn't watch all of those, um, those Twilight movies. Oh God. But she also, that character Bella is also so passive. Like even her persona, um, is it's just this sort of passivity up until death. And she wants to become a vampire because she wants to be with whatever his name is, the vampire guy, Edward. Um, and, um, but women in vampire films are all always viewed as, as passive and not even like actors in their own lives. They're manipulated or, or, um, just moved by the men in, in the, you know, <sighs> this is so interesting. Cause I'm thinking about like the famous vampire move movie about a decade, less than a decade later was interview with the vampire. Tom Cruise was also in that. And that was like when Kirsten Dunst made her um, debut on screen as like a baby vamp. But you're right in that. That was also a very homoerotic portrayal of vampires. And the only female protagonist in that movie was Kirsten Dunst. She was 12 or something. And she was basically infantilized in that entire, even though she was like more violent or something, I think is the way that she was being portrayed. I didn't realize we we're going to talk about vampires, but I'm glad we're really talking about vampires. And so then you have like the, the go-to vampire movie of the 20, the aughts. Is that what people call them? The aughts, the 2010s or whatever, the aughts, uh, which is Twilight. And it kind of reproduces the same thing. You're totally right. It's a very like, it's like a very male centric um, kind of, a, like it's a very male centric subgenre of horror, like the vampire genre, but it is very homoerotic, but it's also, it's like, but it's strange because, you know, like Bella and Edward, they have, you know, she wants to become um, a vampire so she can live in, I don't know, a uh, uh, monogamy, right? Hetero monogamy with him for the rest of eternity. And she actually, she gets pregnant, right? With her half vampire baby because, they get married. They have to get married first because Edward won't have sex with her unless they get married, and then they have sex. And then because the, ha- the babies have vampire because it's Edward's seed <laughs> inside of her, the the fetus grows at a rapid rate because it's a va- half vampire baby. And then she literally, 
allows her body, the baby like literally kills her. And so her body gets quite literally torn apart in order to give birth to her half vampire baby that Edward is, has fathered. And so what she does is she sacrifices her, not only her humanity, but she also sacrifices like her body through the process of like marriage and then sex and then childbirth. And then out of this, this like just complete disintegration of who she is as a woman, then she like is, she emerges, right? She actually gives birth to her new identity as a vampire and then she like lives happily ever after, you know, after they defeat the the bad vampires in Italy or whatever the stupid story is. And there's so then she and Edward and like their their vampire child, um, they'll all live happily ever af after it, to eternity, and they just have like um lots of rowdy sex and things like that. And I remember watching that scene and just being so disturbed, just because it's like there's such like an intense hatred for women. <laughs> entire story and maybe that's what it is I, maybe it's like there's like an intense hatred for women maybe in the subgenre of, of vampire movies within like horror more broadly that is disturbing and actually like pretty salient to cross the time periods if you think about 1987 to kind of like the end of the aughts when the last uh whatever movie came out twilight movie came out yeah no i absolutely agree i think there's um yeah, women are relegated to, I mean, and they're very, even though I think it's, 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 um, I think that there, there, there are, um, uh, there's so much homoeroticism and they're definitely coded completely, um, gay male. There's also this need to, um, reinforce this, um, nuclear family and this idea of, of having, you know, the, the mother, the father, and then the little vampire boys and lost boys is basically named that because of Peter Pan and, um, <clears throat> Wendy who takes care of all the lost boys in never, Neverland. So they're trying to establish that like the head vampire, the oldest, the adult, um, Max is trying to establish a family with um, this mother, Lucy, and it, they're all going to be one ha big happy family of vampires. But it has to be a heterosexual model. It has to, even though it's coded very homosexual, it's a very, very disturbing, very weird. Oh, so like, right. So my emphasis, right, was like, it seems very like um, there seems to be a hatred of women in like the vampire genre but there's also obviously this like hatred of like queer sexuality and like non-conforming gender identity right um and so it, i feel like it, top gun is not a well <laughs> top gun is a horror movie to me <laughs> That's part, you know like the fact that that movie was basically reproduced verbatim in 2022 when it should really be inexcusable to make a movie like that about masculinity just like just like balls to the wall in your face, like white settler, like militarist militarism, that kind of masculinity that comes out of that, just like a total celebration, you know, just like we all know how much money is spent on fighter jets, for example, and they're actually kind of obsolete now. And so like the military industrial complex and the amount of money that I think must have been spent on that movie is probably like half a billion dollars or something like that. What I'm trying to say is, is that like, there is, there is this type of, like, it is homoerotic, but it's, it's like the threat or like the possibility of like queerness being a contagion, right? And so then white hetero um, settler masculinity has to kind of like shore up the boundaries against the threat or the contagion of both like women, right? Women having any power, but then also like uh, any type of non-heteronormative sexuality or gender identity being able to kind of like infiltrate, you know, the the kind of kinship that white settler men um, try to form with each other through these like, you know, these heroic narratives, like the things that you see in Top Gun and Maverick. Um, and so that's totally interesting. I would never, ever have put like the vampire genre into conversation with. Other thing that's so 
interesting about both um, Lost Boys and uh, Fatal Attraction is that in both of them, there is a child. In in Lost Boys, there is a young um, child who has been, who is in the process of being turned into a vampire, Laddie. And in um, Fatal Attraction, the Michael Douglas and Ann Archer um, family have a young child also. And both of the children, they are gendered. Um, the one in Fatal Attraction is a young girl and the one in Lost Boys is a young boy. But it's very low key. They, they don't use pronouns very much and they're very androgynous. Both of them are super androgynous. So that's a great, that's a great clip. You, you got to watch it because it talk about um, asserting at the very end of the movie, um, talk about uh, asserting um, the nuclear family and the heterosexual nuclear family, the heteropatriarchal nuclear family. Um, one of the uh, frog boys who are the two vampire killers um, when Max, who's the, the father vampire, um, he's trying to tell Lucy that he, he wants her to be the mother of the vampires. And, and I wanted you, Lucy. I still want you, Lucy. I want you to come and be a mother to my boys. And one of the frog brothers says, like a, a blood sucking Brady bunch. <laughs> Like literally the best line in the whole movie. So that's that's what they're trying to assert is this idea of the nuclear family. But with vampires. Interesting. I'm thinking of another like major vampire show. It's True Blood. Anyone ever watch did you watch True Blood on HBO? So that was the aughts as well. Um super different vision hypersexual definitely like you're talking about a vampire brady bunch they weren't really a brady bunch because they were wild the vampires in that show are very wild but it is kind of like it is really you're right it is really non-binary it's very like and even like thinking about um the imaginary uh about gender and sexuality in um twilight you know there's like the um like Jacob, there's like the the wolves. Um, and so there's like interspecies intimacies and like interspecies kinship happening, basically. And so I've been thinking a lot about kinship anyway, about kinship and like the, the imaginary of kinship that's portrayed in a movie like Top Gun, which is like, a, you know, I always go back to this, this painting and actually I'll, I'll try to find this painting so we can share it. Kent Monkman, who's a really well-known um, queer Cree visual artist, well, performance and visual artist, does drag as well, um, made this painting that I teach sometimes when I'm doing my Indigenous Gender and Sexuality Studies courses. Um, and it's a painting of these four figures. They're all white men. One is dressed playing Indian. One is like a cowboy. One is like a lawyer. And the other one is, I, I forgot, like has a lumberjack shirt on. And he had does these, uh, Kent does these like panoramic backdrops, kind of like these Emerson-esque um, panoramas of like the West or like majestic mountains and waterfalls. And so it's moonlight, it's moonlit. And there's majestic waterfall and mountainscape in the back. And so it's dark. And then there's this, they're all in a circle and there's this Ford pickup that's shining a light on them. So they're illuminated. Um, kind of like a chiaroscuro kind of approach to that. And they're all, they're all jerking off in a circle together. <laughs> painting is called the four directions <laughs> it's, it's so anyway the reason why i'm referencing this right is i it's such like a hilarious but such an accurate kind of um like a queer indigenous commentary on like the kind of kinship the way the homoeroticism right of like white settler masculinity and the bonds in a movie like top gun or like the maverick version of top gun like that type of kinship. But then you're talking about like vampires having vampire movies where there's like interspecies sex or there's like, it's, you know, it's like a, 
it's an interesting commentary on like queer kinship in the vampire genre too. Even at the same time, there's like creepy approaches to that. Like the Twilight version is, it's like the dangers of this kind of like rogue sexuality and having to shore up the heteronuclear family and like straightness um, and heteronormativity again, or like marriage, for example. But then in play, something like True Blood, there isn't really, it's just kind of like a free for all, if I remember correctly, the, the version of um, kind of like queer kinship that's on display in True Blood. True Blood, we could do an entire week's worth of episodes on True Blood because there are some intense, yeah, um, intense moments in that in that show like there's the 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 vampire i i watched almost all the whole series it got really weird at the end but the the idea of greeting the sun as a way of a vampire um committing suicide and the very old vampires who who um i remember godric in particular um godric was actually like the grandfather of all of these vampires and he finds his morals and he can't go on killing people. So he, he goes out and he, he greets the sun and he commits suicide. Um, but just the, the sort of um, reverence and, and most of the male um, vampires in that show are at least bisexual and, um, they're not 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 all of them um, are are gay. There's a number of them that are gay, but but at least most of them are bisexual, and the women too. So that would be I haven't thought about that series in a long time. But that neither would be have a I. Great... I, I, I did not I did not think <laughs> we we're going to talk about vampires today. But I'm just like I need to rewatch that whole series. I watched the whole thing several years ago. I don't even remember the show ended five, six, seven years ago. I don't remember, but. Um, that was another kind of like very popular portrayal of vampires. Yep. Vampires have been, have been, you know, since like the very beginning, since Bram Stoker, they have been really part of American consciousness. And I don't think people called them out at, f to call them out for the homoeroticism, you know, really until much later, but even Bram Stoker's, I mean, if you read the book, um, it's it's all about men. It's it's all about men, you know, making other men vampires. The women are secondary, you know, if not superfluous characters in almost all of the vampire, both the literary tradition, but definitely um, the uh, the cinematic and even the television. Um, you you don't see really strong female characters until until I guess True Blood. Yeah. I don't think that Bella is a strong female character. No, it's very passive. Yeah. Yeah, no, totally. She's the damsel in distress who gets passed between a vampire and a dog. <laughs> Basically. <laughs> it's like a very disturbing it's plot true. line. <laughs> but people love it, you know? Um, Teenage girls, wow. Love oh, that series. There's, in American horror, there is such a strong tradition of the protagonists or the stories or the things that are happening, whether it's in a TV show or a film, happening to teenagers, right? And like I said, like Kirsten Dunst, an interview with the vampire, is somewhat sexualized in that movie. And she was like 11, maybe 12 years old max um, when she did that movie. And her character is obviously that age too. It's not like she's playing somebody older. And so I've, I've said this just in passing before. I forgot what we were talking about on RPH some months back, but... I'm a, I find it very disturbing that um, that it's very common to portray and then for audiences who are over the age of 18 to consume so much teenage sex. <laughs> and I, I understand like the notions of like the experimentation with gender and sexuality that might be associated with our youth. Um, and then, like, obviously the genre of, like, vampire movies, um, the horror genre, subgenre of vampire movies, obviously seems to be very much into, like, gender and sexual play in a way, whether it's, like, anxieties about that, that heteronormativity has, or just, like, um, you know, wanting to create, like, a queer world 
um, filled with vampires just because we live in such a homophobic and a transphobic society. Um, and yet at the same time, most horror movies center on teens. It's usually girls. It's usually girls who are getting stabbed or getting chased or getting stalked, um, getting mauled, getting dismembered, getting chainsawed, getting raped, um, or just teens like having sex. And I, I really love horror, but that aspect of horror really disturbs me. And, and actually it's not just horror. There's just so much of that. And it seems really predatory. <laughs> and it's, I, I, yeah, when I was younger, I didn't realize that, but I think it's probably over the last five to six years as like, I'm an, obviously Elaine and I talk about TV and television and film constantly on this podcast. I consume a lot of TV and film and it's like everywhere. And it feels really, it's like, um, I think people should just stop. They should stop portraying teen sex, especially for audiences that are like not teenagers. There's something really ethically like, uh, you know, disgusting actually about that. I feel icky when I'm watching a show and I'm like, ah, <laughs> it's like, and I was thinking, um, I wanted to talk when I was thinking about like the horror of heteropatriarchy, I've been really kind of, um, thinking through stalking lately. Um, I mean, this is related to fatal attraction, but not in like the creepy, like the, the jealous woman who's going to murder the, her, her, she's like a jilted lover. You know, she's just like this jealous, crazy woman. There's this whole subgenre, like pretty much all of Tyler Perry's movies are about that too. Um, like the thriller, um, the femme fatale, I guess is what it is. And so that's one aspect of it, but this movie, it follows, um, if folks have watched it, it's one of my favorite horror movies. It came out five, six years ago. I don't remember, but I think about the the thing, it, right? It's supposed to be like this STD. So it's like a play on the, the teenage kind of horror movie where it's like um, this thing is following. It's fo It follows you. And if it ever catches up to you, it murders you. And it like grotesquely like breaks your bones and it like dis disfigures and dismembers your body essentially. And the way that it's transmitted is through having sex. And so like there are scenes in It Follows where they're like teens having sex but what's happening is that like one teen that is being followed is like figures out that the way to get it to stop following them is to pass it on basically as an STD to another person that they've had sex with. And then that person has to deal with the issue. Of course, the premise of the movie is that if it catches up to the person, it whenever, wherever, whenever it catches up to the person and kills them, it will directly go all the way down the line to anyone who has, it has ever followed. And it will just keep killing people that it has followed in the past. And so there's this like frenzy to like give the STD <laughs> essentially to like as many people down the line as possible to like protect yourself so that you have more time to get away from it, you know? So it's going through all of the, the subsequent sex partners essentially. So this is the premise of it follows, which is I think brilliant because it's an, it's like the teen, the teen horror movie, but it turns it on its head talking about like an STD about as like a form of death. But then that also plays into, sorry, I'm all over the place with this, but that plays into what you're talking about with like the, the mass, like the panic and the anxiety and like the homophobia that came out of the AIDS pandemic. Is that a pandemic? Sorry. I don't know if I should use that language. I'm not quite sure what the language should be around like the, what people, what, the heteronormative anxieties about AIDS in the 1980s and the early 90s. But this one is also like, you know, like when you were in like sex ed in school and STDs or STIs, it was like, it's going to ruin your life. You know, <laughs> like if you're like, if you're a loose woman, this is what's going to happen to you. And then it's just going to follow you for the rest of your life. And it's going to destroy your life. You know, this like incredibly sexist, very heteronormative approach to like, abstinence right and like treating sex as if it especially teen sex as if it's like this destructive force essentially and so i think that's what's interesting about it follows is that it has a commentary on that and i think it's making it's kind of an ironic commentary on that but it is at the same time right uh, it's like a horror movie that's kind of making it's trolling itself but horror movies very much because of the teen sex element it's very much like oh if you 
if you have sex before marriage, then like, this is what's going to happen to you. You're going to get fucking carved up in a cave by some like crazy dude. <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying? Yep. And so it's, again, it's just about showing up heteronormativity and like, you know, monogamy essentially. Yep. Yep. And, and yeah, I, I definitely think there's, there's a lot going on and it follows. But before we go into that, we have one more comment from Auntie K's Tarot Insights. Um, being native and my, and my kids into Twilight. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was both offended Bella didn't choose the werewolf and relieved Me he too. wasn't with the white girl and all her drama. <laughs> Same. <clears throat> Same. Yeah. Same Z's. Yep, definitely. Um, I, I, and I, I saw it follows like a long time ago. Well, whatever it came out. And I, I also got the, the AIDS, um, sort of reference, but also just, I think the anxiety, the generalized anxiety around having sex as a teenager, um, and the idea of, um, you know, of um, sharing that with someone you may or may not trust. And of course, in that movie, nobody can oh, trust anybody else because they're passing it on. Yeah. Like with the intent, well, not the intention, but with the knowledge that this person they then may be killed. So there was a lot of layers in that, in that oh, film. Interesting. That were, trust. Trust. And, and I think... Ca- it was sort of a cautionary tale. I think about, um, be careful who you have sex with because, you know, they could be betraying you at the same time. It was very, it was very disturbing movie. It was very weird, but, but, uh, yeah, maybe this, maybe this episode should actually be called the horror of heteronormativity as opposed to heteropatriarchy. (laughs) Because yeah. I'm thinking, actually, now that we're having this discussion, it seems much more about heteronormativity. I mean, heteropatriarchy and heter- heteronormativity, like, work together. But this seems to have a lot to do with, like, also just with, like, sex. Not just misogyny, necessarily. Or, like, binary gender identity. Um, or kind of, like, the monogamous, kind of straight, married sex that is expected. Um, but... Yeah, just anxieties about sex. Just a lot of anxieties about sex is basically and, and, what horror is about. Well, and the the you know you go so you get so when I was watching, well, I watched Lost Boys again. It's probably the fiftieth time I've seen that film. Maybe not that many, but but then you know changed to um, Fatal Attraction, and, and so that like Lost Boys was about male sex and about you know men and um homoeroticism and this sort of um really oppressed male sexuality and repressed um male sexuality um that has to be coded um as as being a vampire uh, because it's not it's not really allowed to be shown um on screen in in the 1980s and and then you you go to fatal attraction and and you have this you know, incredible, like two or three of these incredible sex scenes between Glenn Close and Michael Douglas. Um, and she becomes this evil being like female sexuality is, is evil and it's overwhelming and it's violent and it has to be suppressed. Like she, Glenn Close was, was wild. And you look at, um, and her name was Alex. Um, and and then you look at Michael Douglas wife, Beth. And the first time you see a possibility of the two of them having sex, they've gone out, she's dressed in this sexy black dress and they've, you know, had a little drink and they've been partying. Um, and he goes out to walk the dog. He comes back, you know, expecting to see her in bed ready for him. And their androgynous child is there. And she looks at him and she says, it's just for tonight. So he's rejected. And this is sort of supposed to be, you know, one of the reasons why he goes out and has an affair. Um, and and y- what you see is that the single woman, the unattached woman, her sexuality 
is somehow, you know, evil and and violent. Whereas the married woman there, that is the um, the woman who is under the male control. She is passive and she is acceptable as a sexual partner, but Glenn Close is not. And and the way they make her out to be, it's just a fear of female sexuality. Word. <laughs> Which is pretty fucked up. And, and yeah. like, <laughs> Which is pretty fucked up. <laughs> yeah. So the only way that the women are allowed to have sex in the 80s, at least in the cinema, is if they're married and... Um, and they're mothers of either vampires or androgynous children. But it's not just the 80s either, right? Because no. then, like you were saying, like the Bella character in Twilight is also very passive. She's basically owned by Edward. And these are fairy tales too. I mean, we talk about this as being like in in modern cinema or modern television, but Bella is like um a and so is the character of star in in lost boys they're like sleeping beauties i mean they're passive all the way up till death and death being that transition to vampirism to becoming a vampire and that's sleeping beauty and 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 you know you look at at also the um uh, little red riding hood and the wolf and this idea that um you know that that the wolf in grandmother's clothing um, is made out to be passive, but she has to kill it. Like she has to kill her own sexuality in order to survive. And it, I mean, these are the fairy tales that that Western society feeds its young. So it's no wonder, you know, people are, so, besides the Catholic church, that people are so fucked up about sexuality because this is where you're fed this from the very, you know, from childhood. Yeah. Wow, that was like a, that's a final boss <laughs> kind of analysis you just offered. <laughs> I, no, but you, you know what? You're totally right. Like, can we have a question um, from, from Adam, Adam Polarski? Polarski. Have either of you ever seen Bride of Frankenstein? That has a lot to say about heteropatriarchal mores. Long time ago. Ooh, exactly. Frankenstein. So, uh, okay, we're at 57 minutes. We should probably wrap it up here pretty soon but frankenstein is like kind of a zombie right it's kind of like an og kind of zombie um basically gets right doesn't frank frankenstein gets brought back from the dead right it's kind of like this engineered yep half living half dead thing um that is not quite human but is also not quite dead and i think i watch i've watched a lot of zombie movies and I think a lot about zombies and this is more about, I feel, I feel like the zombie can be invested with lots of different things when it comes to like the politics of representation. Uh, and like, uh, I think about Jody Birds, uh, who's a Chickasaw scholar, Jody Birds book, Transitive Empire, where she does this brilliant analysis of zombie imperialism, where she talks about the figure of the Indian. It's a very kind of like post-structuralist um, understanding, but the figure of the Indian is a zombie because uh, kind of within like liberal world making um, or like liberal understandings of, of how social order, the ordering of humanity and things like that, just how the world is organized. Um, there are these like tropes or these figures like the Indian that can be invested with any kind of um, discursive weight to perform something for a particular political need or a moment. And so she talks about how the Indian, you know, in the post 9-11 moment is invested or reinvested with um, like the figure of the terrorist being the primary kind of like villain against U.S. imperialism, that U.S. imperialism has to fight, you know, the, fight, the fact that like the code word for Osama bin Laden is Geronimo, um, famously, right? We famously understand that. And when Osama bin Laden is murdered under Obama's administration, they actually say something about like Geronimo has been killed. Or, I, I forgot what the actual language is, but this is this is what happened. So anyway, she does this brilliant analysis about how the zombie, um, basically from like this this understanding of how liberalism operates, is this figure, this thing that can be um, 
resuscitated essentially over and over again, a code, as you were saying, um, Elena, it's a code or a sign that can be resuscitated over and over again to kind of fulfill the needs of a certain, um, to crush a certain anxiety, to repress, right? This notion of like, let's say like rabid female sexuality or like queer sexuality um, that might be a contagion against heteronormativity. And so I feel like zombies are kind of play a similar role in the, the genre of horror where like genre, zombies can represent anything. They can represent Indians. They can represent women. They can represent LGBTQ folks. They can represent black folks, right? They can represent terrorists. Um, but also the inverse of that, and maybe this is just because I'm like, I don't know, a native person who watches um, a zombie movies a lot, but I feel, I feel much more that zombies and horror in general is much more like Right. It's like a settler society reflecting itself back to itself. Cause it's like the, right. Like the, the homoeroticism, like the, the fact that it's just like men, t like men being like having anxiety about being men or like possibly like wanting to have sex with other men <laughs> like that. It's literally just like horror is just like a, a playground for like settler, like, uh, like white gender and sexuality or like identity to kind of like work its shit out back to itself. And so the zombie is like the thing that is like supposed to be kind of like the villain or the anxiety against which like the, the heroes of a, of a horror movie or whatever, ha they have to overcome that to reestablish like white heteronormative settler order, for example. But as a native person watching that, I'm just watching settler colonialism comment on itself. And the zombie is actually like settler colonialism like the Indian isn't a real thing. Native people are real people. And we have like, we're, we are, we face colonization and genocide, right? But the Indian is not a real person. That is a made up fan. That's a fantasy figure that settler colonialism can then invest all of its fucked, fucked up anxieties about itself onto and to play around with and to maim and to try to kill and like to do anything that it wants to do with that, like the figure of the Indian. But really it's just about itself. And so I feel like the whole kind of zombie genre is kind of like that. Um, I know that that was very meta and I did not explain that as well as I wanted to, but we were talking about vampires before, but I think a lot about zombies when I think about horror movies. And the comment about the Bride of Frankenstein brought that up for me because that's like OG zombie. Yeah, it is very OG zombie and, and, and um, <clears throat> I haven't seen the Bride of Frankenstein in a long time, but me neither, but uh um, to me, the, well, I mean, Frankenstein, the, the book, the novel was written by Mary Shelley. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah. Was one of the first Western feminists. feminists. Well, her, her mother was, yep. um, and, um, I, I read, reread that book when I was in college and <clears throat> really also thought it was about, um, this idea of male birth, like the one, um, the one thing that women can do that men can't do, um, is give birth. And there has always been this, this sort of subgenre of both horror, but also sci-fi of male birth. It's very Freudian. Um, <laughs> it's very Freudian. <clears throat> and you see it. Like, I mean, I could, I could, I could go way into the rabbit hole, but like you see it in Alien. Um, I, that's you, exactly what I was thinking. All yeah. alien abduction movies and like alien movies are about that. Yeah. So we can have a whole other podcast Holy about cow. that. But, but yeah, I mean, definitely a lot of heteropatriarchy, heteropatriarchal mores in, in, uh, in, in all the Frankenstein movies. And then we have one more comment where Pilgrim um, also the aspect that Edward is much older than Bella in reality is worth knowing. Well, yeah, cause he's like hundreds of years old. Yeah. He's um, like hundred, 200 years old. She's like six, 15, 16, something 15, like that. 15, I think when they meet 15, 16, when they meet, yep. uh, just creepy again, going back to like the, the predatory, like, um, just like the predatory relationship that you're kind of expected as a viewer to have with a horror 
show that or a movie that you're watching is like, yeah, I don't know. We need to like yeah, think about some like super cool decolonial queer like feminist horror. And then those I'm sure those things exist that I need to find out where those are and watch them. But yeah. Well, we need to do a podcast on Firebite. We talked about that. The, oh yeah. The, the Australian oh, vampire right. movie. Which which really turns the whole vampire genre on its head because it has male and female vampires. Anyway, we're not going to talk about Firebite now, but we'll have to talk about it sometime. But the other thing I was going to note just about, like, you brought up um, Anne Rice, the interview with the vampire, which was also OG. I mean, yeah. Anne Rice wrote Interview with the Vampire a long time ago. And Anne Rice, if I am remembering correctly, Anne Rice at one point came out as trans. Oh, I don't, I don't that, remember at all. Actually, I, I re- I'm thinking maybe, maybe, maybe my mind is completely gone. But there's a lot of yeah, with the original Anne Rice um, interview with a vampire, a lot of weird pedophilic, like with Death the too. the young the young girl. But really, the relationship, of course, was, was between Lestat and and Louis um, Lewis. Um, in the and I haven't seen the new one that's out on HBO. I, I'm only remembering the Brad Pitt and Tom Cruise one. Um, but the real rush relationship was between the men, and it's always between the men. Except Anne Rice totally changed um, as she got older. I hope I'm not misgendering her. Um, um, and you see a lot more non-binary, a lot more non-heteronormative relationships in like when you get to queen of the damned um things have radically changed but then that's a whole other podcast also queen of the damned you mean like the movie that Aaliyah was in queen of the damned i didn't see that movie but queen of the damned i think was one of the last books that Anne rice wrote so Anne rice is um Anne rice's depiction and affirmation of gay and transgender people uh, this came out shortly after, I guess she passed away about a little under a year ago in December, 2021, honoring the queerness of Anne Rice. So see, those are some of the headlines, um, kind of after she passed away, uh, retrospectives Anne Rice, LGBTQ icon, advocate, and literary genius passes away. Okay. Anne Rice and her homoerotic vampires left an immortal mark on gay culture. Yeah. So I don't think sh- she or they necessarily identified, but definitely, um, the, the queerness of Anne Rice's vision of like the world of vampires is definitely uh, noted. Queen of the Damned. Yeah, I, sorry. I'm like, I'm now on a total tangent. It was, wait, is this based on, that's a vampire movie. Oh my gosh. Queen of the Damned is a 2002 vampire movie loosely based on the third novel of Anne Rice's The Vampire Chronicles, The Queen of the Damned. Okay. Aaliyah played the lead role in that. Aaliyah being, she was preyed upon by R. Kelly. Have any, have people watched Surviving R. Kelly? Talk about, oh, oh, the horror, the nightmare of heteropatriarchy, the story of R. Kelly. Because Aaliyah was like 14. R. Kelly was like 31 or something when he, when they had, what's the best phrase for it? It it wasn't a sexual relationship because she was 14. It and was almost like a dominate, dominator. I mean, I don't, he kept them locked up. It was disgust. It's disgusting. The story of R. Kelly is disgusting. And so anyway, you just brought up something where it's like, here's a movie that Aaliyah was like starring in. She was just trying to get her career going. She was so young. She was so young when she passed away. I think she passed away either before that movie came out. I think she might have before the movie was released or something. But like, here she is portraying, right? Um, possibly like, I don't. I haven't watched Queen of the Damned. I just remember this because of her story, her kind of, um, her sad story and through her teen years. But that just reminded me of the whole story of R. Kelly. And if we're really going to talk about like the horror of heteropatriarchy, that was just the connection I was making in my mind. That's all. Because like that, I the story of R. Kelly is just like, talk about pedophilia, just talk about misogyny. 
talk about just just the most horrific kind of heteropatriarchy imaginable. That story. That man. Anyway. Yeah. I have to admit, I read about it, but I have not been able to watch that show. I just think, it's hard. It's really yeah. it's really hard. I I stopped several times. I was like, you know, I'm gonna make it through this series because like these women, because it's like important to like witness the stories of these women who survived R. Kelly. Um but yeah, it took me like weeks and weeks to make it through the entire first season of that series because of that. The real life horror. The real life horror. Patriarchy. And that's the other thing. I mean, we've been using, well, I mean, you know, like genres like horror, which is a very popular um, American genre. That's really like a commentary on life itself. Right. And so. And the anxiety, I mean, settler anxiety, of course, you know, is coded into horror movies. What are you most afraid of? And, you know, we could have, we could have done a deep dive into, into, you know, the, the Stephen King industrial complex and all of the, the, uh, um, you know, Indian graveyard, Indian burial ground, that's a whole genre, but really it, it, it boils down to settler anxiety. And a lot of it is around the heteropatriarchy. And a lot of it is around sexuality and, and particularly males inability to, um, to really deal with their own sexuality in, in nonviolent, um, you know, normal, what is normal? Um, I don't, what, I don't know. Nonviolent ways. Like how do you deal with your sexuality by not, by not, um, you know, throwing your violence onto female sexuality and, I mean, you see, like, I see that in all the horror movies. Like, there's there's just, you know, repressed um, homoeroticism. There's homophobia and there's misogyny and there's fear of women's sexuality and there's fear of women's power. You know, it's just, I mean, I could, I yeah, I'm going to stop. Well, yeah, I think that's a good place to wrap up. Um, sorry for being so scattered today. <laughs> It's a Sunday afternoon. Couldn't help it. Uh, yeah, I just think that um, whether it's settler colonialism or like heteropatriarchy or heteronormativity, it's just, you know, it follows. I mean, it just, and every time you think you got away from it, it's like, ah, it's like, it's like it just haunts you. We'd even talk about haunting, like the genre of haunting, like, talk about being haunted all the time by this shit it's like you can have the most ratty batty political analysis and be like the strongest i'll just talk for myself for my own position like the strongest woman and like you still can't escape it you can't escape it <laughs> and it's still just there it's like it's like right it's in it's like right outside the door it's like in bed with you it's just like it just fucking haunts you and I, it would be really nice not to be haunted by <laughs> heteropatriarchy or like, or like the alien, um, what's the other sub? It's not the abduction or like they put something in you. It's like a parasite. It's like the thing that goes inside your body and that feeds off of you. That is also what heteropatriarchy feels like to me. And yeah. it's like inside you and you're like, just, you're like trying to extract the thing out of you. So not only does it like haunt you, it follows you like, Sometimes it really fucks you up and it maims you. And like, if you can come back from it, you're trying to like recover your humanity, but you get what I'm saying, but it's also like inside you. And so you're having to like, I don't know, get the trauma. <laughs> it's like, it's like traumies are like the alien that's like slithered down your throat and is like eating your guts alive, essentially. Like th that's how I seriously, some when I think about heteropatriarchy and heteronormativity, I literally think about these scenes from horror movies because that's, Honestly, truly, that is often how it feels. Yep. <laughs> I hate it so much. <laughs> I just want the zombie to die. Yeah. It's like, yeah. and then when you stab one in the head, then like, there's just so many more. And I feel the same way about settler colonialism. Like, 
Cena's going to kill me when I say this, but just burn it down, <laughs> get, burn all the zombies down and then like take their ashes and, and make a pile. And, and I don't know what to do with the pile of the ashes of the zombies, but like make it so it can't reanimate. However you do that. Yeah. I just want to, I don't, no more, no more liberal. Like anyway, it's a Foucauldian thing. I don't have to go into it. I'm sure no one gives a crap. <laughs> I wrote like a part of my dissertation on it, but yeah, I just want, I just want the zombie to be done. It has a lot to do with liberalism, but yeah, the zombie, the alien parasite of, um, settler colonialism, heteropatriarch and heteronormativity. It would be really nice to not be haunted anymore. But on that really kind of depressing note, uh, happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. (laughs) Do you, um, do you give out candy? Wait, you well, not where you live necessarily, right? No, we don't have anybody out out here in the in the sticks, but uh um yeah, it's still one of my favorite holidays. The house, we got the house all decorated up. Heck yeah. yeah. I'm going to, I did not decorate this year just because I'm in a new house, but I have, I have small decorations. I'm going to put them out so that the kiddos, you know, don't feel like it's a murder house tomorrow night and that I bought candy. I have anxiety about like not having enough candy. So I think I'm going to go get some more candy maybe tonight, even though the shelves are just bone dry at this point at like Walmart and target. I'm just going to try to get more candy. Cause I want to make sure they all get, I want to make sure that my house is like a house where they're like the cool, house. that, that lady has good candy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yep. Well, thank you to everyone who listened or watched while we did this. I really appreciate it. Um, thanks for spending a Sunday afternoon with us. This will be a podcast episode as well, um, but we'll be back in a couple of weeks recording more stuff about the things in the world. i um, not quite sure what our next episode will be about, but thanks, everyone. Uh, just a reminder, I know everyone who's listening is a patron. Thank you again so much for supporting our Patreon Uh, If you know anyone who'd be interested in joining to have access to these kinds of things um, or to just like donate money to red media, we need, we need the money. Like we just need it. Um, And any help is really appreciated. And like I said, we need the money. (laughs) So please consider. Elena, you can say something. I was just going to say, because we need the candy for Halloween. We need more money. Yeah. Support all those young ghouls. (laughs) Young ghouls. Aw. That should be the name of a podcast, Young Ghouls. <laughs> Very cute. All right. All right, all you young ghouls <laughs> listening to this or signing off. <laughs> Happy Halloween. <laughs>